Hello everyone, welcome to the Real World Code Season 1 Debugging Downtime. I'm your host, Z Spencer, and in this season, we're debugging a Rails API which just keeps going down. This uncut recording is a mob programming session where Betsy Habel, Jackson Laka, and I orient ourselves towards the problem and make a very small code change to try and fix it. Because it's uncut, there will be pauses and chasing of weird errors. Uncut sessions are best listened to in the background, like a radio show. When you find a diamond in the rough, tweet with the real world code hashtag and we'll use that feedback to tighten down our future edits. It takes about 8 hours to make a rough cut of 2 hours of video, so if you like this season and want us to take the time to clean it up, you can buy the entire season at our website, wegogear.com. Once we've made about $1,000 from sales, we'll do a rough cut, remove dead air, and basically clean it up a little bit. And when we reach $5,000, we'll do a tight cut and highlight the diamonds in the rough, making each episode about 30 minutes. For those of you who are watching, today uh, I have a very bad agenda. Uh, not a bad agenda, but like I have a, I have a very succinct agenda. We're going to take four-ish Pomodoros, which are 25-ish minute sessions. Our first one is going to be dedicated uh, towards working with Jackson to kind of observe what's going on and orient ourselves around the problem, um, as well as to introduce our, our delightful guests. Um, and then the second, third, and fourth of these sessions will be us trying to solve the problem uh, as it's described. So I am going to start and introduce our ourselves. So I am Z. I am uh, one of the partners at a three-person worker cooperative that focuses on education and training for technology. Um, we believe that education and training is missing from a lot of professional careers, um, and we're just kind of left to flounder on our own. But you don't have to flounder on your own. You can call us. We will help you. Um, one of our wonderful trainers and coaches is to my... Whoops. Stage left, Betsy <laughs> the Muffin Hable. Uh, uh, Betsy uh, is a absolutely wonderful programmer. I have worked with her for how many years now? Four years? Um, I think it's previously... only three, but it feels like longer in a good way. It, it feels like decades for some parts <laughs> of it, and then parts of it are less. Um, but yeah, Betsy is one of the very few programmers I've ever met who can go from talking for you know, in a single 30 minute window, talk about both exactly how browser refresh like and reflow works in Chrome and Safari and Firefox and the differences between them, as well as dive into like different consensus strategies for distributed like data systems. So she is very broad and very deep. Um, and that is part of why we love working with her and why we encourage people to, you know, bring her on board to help them work through some of their hard problems. Um, to my stage, Right is uh, Jackson. Jackson is the head of product at Notably. Um, Notably is one of our uh, partner clienty kind of things. They are off their sponsor. They're essentially sponsoring this stream by giving us access to their source code and some amount of cashola. Um, and we are in exchange helping them solve a problem in the hopes that uh, that you know people will like what we do and hire us to help them solve their problems. So um, that's the two of us. Uh, Jackson's background, like, could you let's, I guess, describe what's your background, Jackson? You're head of product now at Notably, but what is it you do outside of that? Uh, so I'm one of the founders of Notably, focus on the product and design side there. But outside of that, I generally work with startups on product and design. And uh, so I kind of bounce between those two things. And right now I'm super excited and super thankful for uh, Z and Betsy to jump in on this project for us, but and also for doing it live. So awesome. Cool. Um, so I'm going to try and introduce the concept of Notably first, <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then from there, we'll kind of uh, orient ourselves uh, around, the, around the problem at hand. So Notably uh, is a, it's think of it like Instagram for like families is really the, the the shitty VC version way of phrasing it. Um, <laughs> if you were to pitch a VC, this is how you would start. Probably not. Don't do this. Um, they focus on providing an ad-free experience that uh, keeps the customer's data private first and foremost, so that you can trust them when they are when you upload a picture of your niece uh, that it's not going to go out to you know a random person or you know. Uh, Target isn't going to realize that you have a niece now and start advertising to you that, oh my goodness, you should buy the 
world's greatest uncle or world's greatest aunt or whatever shirt. Um, you just share a picture and you enjoy that and you have you you find value in community in your family as opposed to being sold to the the ad the ad minions. Um, I, I'm not at all emotionally appealed by this, appalled by ads at all, by the way. Um, initially, oops, oh no, our VNC fell over. All right, no, we're good. Um, they were acquired in 2014 uh, and raised about a million dollars of investment to build out the product initially. Um, they successfully avoided making 10x growth. So they started getting customers and users and those users were using it, but their parent company was really pushing them to sell out their values of privacy and like attention, right? They wanted their customers to not be sold. They wanted their customers to be they're served, not sold, right? Um, and so they bought the company back in 2016. Uh, they're currently uh, at around $2,000 a month in monthly recurring revenue, which uh, isn't a bajillion dollars, but it's also not like nothing to sneeze at. Um, and then, but their expenses right now are about 3,000 a month in, in recurring expenses. So as you can imagine from a business proposition <laughs> perspective, that is, uh, you know, your, your, your cash flow goes down like this and that is not that is not a, a good spot to be in if you want to be a self-funded, self-started business. Um, yeah, can I add to so that? Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, go for it. Thanks, I appreciate that. Good description. Uh, so I would just add to that, that we've, we've basically gone from like this VC funded model of trying to just get growth at all costs to now, and not at all costs, I shouldn't say that because we've always had this kind of same morals and, and focus, but, uh, from a product standpoint and from a standpoint of like how much we're spending on the service, we've gone from like spending as much as we need and wherever and having a pretty big team to now taking it back and being completely bootstrapped. And so we've been focused on like reducing our costs and optimizing the service and also starting to build in ways to, to grow the revenue stream. So um, in addition to automatically being able to subscribe to photo books, like anyone, whether it's you, the person who's posting, the parent who's posting photos and videos, of your kids or it's like your mom or grandma uh, that's keeping up with your kids on notably they can automatically subscribe to a photo book and just have those show up on their doorstep uh, whenever you post 50 photos so that's one of the ways we're working to build out the revenue stream and the other way is we're, we're exploring moving to a subscription model um, which will be really interesting but first and foremost uh, and I don't know if you want to take this and describe the problem or if you'd like me to uh, oh, no, please, please describe the problem that you're experiencing from a customer and business perspective. Yeah, because sure. Cohere is all about solving customer and business problems <laughs> as opposed to solving technology problems. We use technology to do that, but that's not the point. The cool. point is to solve real people's problems. Yeah, so, so in general, I would say that we're having trouble just keeping the service up during times of heavier use. And for a service like us, that tends to be during the holidays when... Uh, it's Halloween and every parent on the planet is taking a, a thousand photos of their kids uh, and trying to post them to different various networks, including notably. Uh, so that's one of the times that we have uh, challenges. And uh, as of this Christmas, it somehow it reached this, this tipping point that the usage level was high. Uh, and during that Christmas bump, this issue, whatever this issue is that we're going to explore became amplified. Um, and when Z jumped in previously to take a look at this so, at this product. Uh, clarifying question. Yeah. When you say this issue, what was the effect to the customer of this issue? Well, what, what, what happened? Uh, right? uh, so basically you would be, for instance, using the notably iPhone app or Android app, and all of a sudden you would, uh, essentially all your data is safe, but you would not be able to refresh your feed. You would be having very slow times when you're trying to load more photos or videos or quotes or what have you. Uh, and so ultimately you're getting to this point where the app is just feels broken. Mm -hmm. Cool. Betsy, do you have any questions about that, about like what around the customer experience and, and that kind of thing? Um, so rephrasing to make sure I've got it. Um, you're not necessarily seeing any outages, outages per se, but when people are doing normal kind of browsing interactions with the site, not even trying to upload things necessarily, just trying to um, view the adorable photos that someone just posted of their niece wearing their first Halloween costume. Um, they're having trouble doing so, which obviously makes them not really trust notably as a social network because that's its primary function for them. That's right. Yeah, it's, a, it's not a good thing. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. 
uh, but ultimately, like, you know, it'll get to the point where it's either, I would say it's, it feels more binary as a user. It's either working or it's not working. Uh, yeah. And so there's not a whole lot of times where it's just slowed to a crawl. It's more just like from the back end, I guess it's just tipping over. And mm -hmm. we're at the point where it's just like you can't load what you're looking for. And that's no fun. Uh, okay. The good thing is that uh, everything that people are able to successfully post has been successfully saved and backed up. And there's been no problems as far as like retrieving those again. And I think that's a, I just mentioned that because I think that from a user perspective, that's often a concern when you see mm -hmm. a service that's down is, did I lose everything that I've posted over the last number of years? Um, and that kind of thing. And the answer is absolutely not. It's all there. It's safe. But we do need to find a way that more people could use this product at one time. Cool. Um, so, so the problem is, is pretty critical to your success as an organization, right? Like we're not just, we're not just, you know, making a pixel move four sides to the left. We're not just, you know, teaching you how to use react for fun and profit. We are solving a, a, a problem that is preventing your organization from being successful. Um, and I think that's a really important part of, um, lean engineering is that we focus on the most valuable thing at any one point in time. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really exciting that that's what we're going to get to do. Um, so yeah, my, my hope is that, uh, we can spend the next, uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, reviewing some of the infrastructure stuff that, uh, is happening, looking through some of the history of, of this event. Um, what I've done is I've taken the time to, pull up uh where did my mouse go there it is uh i've got heroku here um so it's got our metrics here and our activity and that kind of stuff i've got uh, uh you're using scout which is kind of like a new relic or data dog for uh for rails apps and heroku apps uh, and so it's telling us about our n plus one queries and our super slow uh access controls you've got paper trail However, we are out of logs, so I don't know how useful paper trail is going to be for us today. And then we, of course, have our GitHubs where we can access the source code. We have the API documentation in case we decide to make any changes to things that might impact the API. We should know what's going on there. We have Amazon RDS set up, um, and we have two database instances, our core instance and stage. And we've also got our sidekick control panel, which is showing the 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 jobs processed in a given time period uh, by by sidekick. And then we have airbrake for exception tracking and uh, just kind of like looking at the occurrences of errors. And finally, we have uh, Slack. And I think I'm getting a little bit of feedback again. Um, I don't know if what that's about, but I'll hopefully stop it in a second. Um, so yeah, those are our those are our, our places that we can go to kind of orient ourselves around the problem, um, and I think the first thing we should do is go to Betsy and say, Betsy, please, where should we start looking, and tell us why you want to look there. Yeah, so actually the first place I want to start is confirm my understanding of some background stuff. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding is that Z, um, we got ourselves attached to this problem because of some issues Jackson was seeing over the holidays um, that were the issues um, we previously described around the site falling over. Um, and you did some emergency triage um, where what you saw was a really, really heavy level of database IO that was overflowing what the RDS level they were at could provide. Um, and so the problem was solved in the short term by throwing more money at hosting, but that's not sustainable long term because notably is a fairly lean organization. And so we're trying to get our IO back to a point where we can bump down our RDS spend again. Yeah, I'd say that's about 90% accurate. I think okay. the, the the one thing that is slightly, uh, that needs a little bit of clarification is even, it looks like even if we scaled the servers, the RDS as big as possible, mm -hmm. we still are getting these recurring periods of uh, significant request timeouts. So mm -hmm. right now, if you look at the, the console here, you'll yeah. see that I'm hovered over Thursday the 10th around two, midnight to two o'clock UTC, at which point there was 2,500 request timeouts. And that happened again, again around 
20 to 2200 UTC. Um, and that was 2000 request timeouts. And then it happened again around Sunday the 13th, again at kind of this 20 to 2200 UTC or this midnight UTC kind of time period. And eventually, I believe the the problem is going to continue because no matter how much we throw against it, because uh, we keep getting into this state where the database is getting rapid fire attacked by by Notably's own servers, is I believe what we've dis discovered. Um, mm -hmm. Does that match your recollection, uh, Jackson? Yep, that sounds about right. And and all these these um, basically these series of H12s uh, at those points, that's typically uh, when we're jumping in and doing a manual restart to get the app up and going. So and that's a reboot of the database. Uh, scaling down dynos, rebooting the database, and then scaling everything back up. And that Got typically it. that typically gets things going again pretty quickly. And the thing that's really concerning to me about this looking at it is, I don't know, like, there may be some culturally cultural thing that I'm not aware of, um, but in most of the cultural and faith traditions I'm aware of, um, Thursday, December 10th isn't a particular holiday or anything. And so that seems like it would be a normal load rather than um, elevated load. Um, mm -hmm. And so the presence of a lot of those things during normal load conditions is really concerning to me. Yep, and I would put that in the, in, in the category of like, there's kind of like the pre-Christmas situation and then the post-Christmas mm -hmm. situation. And the pre-Christmas situation is this would happen every every now and again, but it was typically load-based, it seemed, uh, it appeared. It, but I would say after Christmas, this has been something that I would say at least every two days uh, we're experiencing this issue. So uh, thank you. That's really good context. Um, what's really interesting to me about that um, is did you experience a lot of signups on Christmas or anything like that? Uh, more, but nothing that w I think would move the needle okay. significantly. Um, so to me, um, one of the things that that tells me is that something is that there, like, when I think about what Christmas would look like on the Notably platform, that seems to me like that would be a time when there was a lot of stuff uploaded um, mm -hmm. and so a lot of data created. And so what's interesting to me is that from the outside, it seems like what may have happened is whatever query strategy you're using, um, you're using right now was adequate for the database like total volume of data you had before Christmas and is not is no longer adequate for the total volume of data you have after Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to validate that really quickly. Um, by opening up RDS and seeing if there's any kind of like disk space stuff we can see, um, if there isn't any kind of disk space taken up metric that we can get insight into here, I think the next step would be to be looking at like overall record size from a console or something, um, but just kind of validating by instinct that the total volume of data in the database spiked on Christmas. Um, that seems to make sense from a business perspective, but um, I don't so know that until I've seen it. We, we have access to the RDS CloudWatch monitoring for, mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the production database. And I, th I don't know if we have, so it was Christmas two weeks ago? I feel like it's more than two weeks ago. Yeah, four weeks. Um, yeah, it looks like, so if I if we look at the storage space storage currently, uh, we're, we're doing pretty good from a uh, availability perspective. We've got 400 gigs mm -hmm. uh, at the, at the, in the initial downtime, uh, and I don't have that, unfortunately, historical data right now. Um, we did see that the database did fill up 
it, not the database, but the hard disk did fill up and that caused the application, the database to go down completely. Um, but I think that was caused by the PostgreSQL logging system taking over everything. Okay. So instead, what I believe we're seeing is we've got these IOPS per second that are being used and uh, the amount of disk space we have, 400 gigabytes, gives us a burst rate of about, uh, sorry, a sustained write rate of about 3,000 IOPS per second. Is that right, Jackson? I can't remember the math we did. I don't recall. Um, but the, the good news is we can look at the, so if we look at the last three days, we, we can see mm -hmm. right around you, you know, 114 UTC, which uh, is 114, yeah. So 20, 18 to four o'clock on the 14th, we can look at that chunk of information and kind of see how the IOPS are. And as you can mm -hmm. see, we saw some spikes here where we were writing a pile of stuff to the database and writing a pile of stuff to the database here. And this pile of writes, right is directly correlated to this downtime from the 13th to two o'clock. Um, In addition, I'll add that the connections, the database connections also skyrocket in tandem with the writes. Mm -hmm. And so typically when we reach 160, 170, 180 connections, uh, that's when I know that the, it's gonna fall over. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find the connection the active connections, active transactions. That's interesting. I wonder what that looks like. Nothing, because we're probably not logging it correctly. Oh. Uh, network throughput? Nope. Uh, if you drop back to the, the dashboard, it's it's right above IOPS. Or ah, sometimes. Oh, that's, oh, here yeah. we go, yeah. Yeah. connections. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it does look like something wakes up and makes an aggressive amount of connections, and then yeah. it looks like, is this a reset period, Jackson? It's a reset, the yeah. The 13th? Yep. And then another one at the 14th? So you did two resets in like a 24-hour period? Yeah, in like a six-hour period. Ugh, that's brutal. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know um, if anyone could, I don't know if everyone heard the low whistle, I just... <laughs> Um, as you can imagine, this is not sustainable from a business perspective. <laughs> it's not sustainable from a, a resetting the database uh, person perspective either. Yeah, that's just brutal. It's brutal, right? So, um, so let's so let's let's think about this, uh, uh, Betsy. Uh, where should what what should we what should we look at next? Right? Like we've, we 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 I think we still need to make some observations about the system before we make a decision about how to proceed. Yeah. But uh, where, where would you like to explore before we... What I'd love to look at next would be the logs from around these, like, little zones of horrible failure. All right. Um, hopefully we can find some of that in Paper Trail. I know we're concerned about how useful it's going to be. But January 15th is the last log processing we see, so January 14th is before that. Yeah, the problem is paper trail, the logging happened, like it, it, it's a day by day, like yeah. logs amount. So if we, I, I think we should be able to search by time if we use this magic pony here. And then we look there maybe, or how do we, I have not used, oh wait. Yeah, seek to date or time. All right, uh, January thirteenth at twelve. Or how about uh, eleven? When did it start, uh, Betsy or Jackson? Um, let's look at uh, RDS again. Looks like January thirteenth at around uh, started. Let's say twenty two hundred UTC. All right. Uh, would you be? Let's. I, I, I'm going to let you go back to driving and poking. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, no. I'm just making it explicit. You don't have to apologize. Uh, like uh, so that that way we can figure that out. Uh, uh, maybe it's plus zero or minus zero. Colon zero. That's annoying. 
Uh... Okay, that looks fine. It's still saying 10 p.m. minus 0, 0,500, so we might have to a add five hours. All right. So here we are at January 13th at 2200 Eastern. Or no, what is what is negative 5 GMT? Negative 5 GMT is Eastern. All right, so this is 10 o'clock Eastern. So if the window is 11 o'clock GMT minus 5, is that 6 p.m. Eastern? Or is that, or have I got it backwards? Bad. Ten. January 14th, 3 a.m. UTC. Okay, let's look for that. Oh, no, but that's me adding. Sorry. Um, that's 13th at 1700. I think I'm mathing correctly. If I'm not, we can try the other one. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I can never I, do time zone math in my head. Um, I've just given up on it at this point. And the robot that I just asked said that it is 5 o'clock Eastern is 10 o'clock GMT. So I think we're at the right spot. Okay. Cool. Alrighty then. And is, uh, I think we can close this weird little uh, search window. Thing? Okay. Yeah, and I think you do that by clicking uh, the little search. It's this little. I'm pointing with my finger. Let me just click it for, for Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, it's gone. Yay! Uh, so January third. At 5 p.m. GMT is what we're looking for, and we are back at January 15th because I think we clicked the live tail feature. So we're gonna have to seek seek back to the January uh, 13th again. Cool. <laughs> uh, doo -doo. Am I not spelling January correctly? No, it's fine. Okay. It's 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 matching it as Sunday, January thirteenth at twelve o'clock in the little green box underneath it. So we should be good. So this is the point where I pitch honeycomb.io. <laughs> <laughs> honeycomb.io <laughs> makes your application observable by using event streams in place of logs so that you can do blah, 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 magic ponies. At least that's my understanding from Twitter threads. I actually have never used Honeycomb, but the, the value proposition they profess is that all of this kind of log filtering becomes a lot easier. Uh, maybe someday when I have a lot of money, I'll be able to use Honeycomb because they're mostly targeting the small to medium businesses, not the, the little baby companies like ours. Um, I've seen demos and it looks pretty magical for this kind of problem. <laughs> All um, right. I'm seeing a bunch of moment load, moments user load. Um... Is there a, it doesn't look like you have any kind of uh, per request annotations of your logs. So there doesn't appear to be a way, oh no, nope, there it is. There's one for jobs, C80ECF9, yeah. right there. Um, but do we have one for the web? Actually, this site might be a good time to go to the APM and see if they can, if they have any aggregated view. I, sorry. Ah. I if they have any aggregated view of what requests were being made a lot during then. Okay. I think that we should be able to do that here. I don't, I have not used Scout in Anger, or sorry, this is Airbrake, not Scout. Uh, I think you want to go... Back to here, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a green one. So I have, I have not used Scout in Anger, so I don't know how to navigate it super well. Um, so we're Neither have I. Together. This will be an experiment. Uh... <laughs> But presumably, we can look at time windows at times, like, for example, that looks good. Sunday, and I'm assuming this is UTC. We will see. I'm, I'm assuming it's GMT. So, so uh, free feedback, user experience feedback to anyone maintaining any kind of infrastructure monitoring or observability tool. Include the time zone in your user 
interface because the fact that we've had to ask ourselves three or four different times, wait a second, what time zone is this? Is, uh, is an indication of a user experience problem that needs to be fixed. Um, uh, so, you know, I will take royalties on future sales if you implement this because, no, no I won't do that. Ooh. Nice so, find. Here's an interesting little spike. It's interesting that it's got more throughput, but it's not as much time in Heroku. Yeah. Or or it's... Or whatever so, the pink thing is. So it looks like Scott uh, goes to your time zone, correct? Are we in San Francisco or are we in DC right now? We are in Amazon Cloud. I think we're inside of... Which I think we're in UTC in our Amazon Cloud because it's saying it's 1830 right now. Uh, as far as Scout is reporting, though, because I think so. It depends on if it's the the user's time zone or is it the application's time zone. Because uh, I don't know about either of those things. To me, it looks like Scout is real time to my Eastern time zone where I'm sitting. Okay, so when you're when you're on Scout, and, and it seems to okay. Think, okay. So the so most recent think... time is one thirty. So let's let's switch this to UTC for kicks and giggles Our because entity. yes, yes. And let's hope let's hope to God that that functions. Oops, you passed it. Thanks. There you go. <sighs> oh, that's gonna feel better. Isn't it though? Uh, uh, now, how do we get back? This looks good. Um, I'm going to refilter. One hour ending. Okay, it looks like the same graph. What if we extend the timeline so that we can kind of like filter in on what we expect the time to be? Yeah, and maybe end on the 15th or something so that we know. Oh. Huh. That's that interesting. is interesting. Like I'm gonna just switch the time. Unfortunately, this is interesting in ways that make me like inter interested in the data we're see like or concerned about whether we're actually actively reporting data. Um, I mean, it looks like what's, what's happening correct? is the queue time oh, okay, is spiking. Yeah. yeah. So this this is good. This means that the, these spikes these are the spikes where everything was falling over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And actually, cool. if you if you drag with the cursor, you may know this, but if you drag with the cursor, you could zoom in on a specific window, and then it will find uh, issues within that if you want to, if you do the drop down. Okay, so this, how do we how do we zoom right in there? So it's eight thirty p.m. to five a.m. So that's a how many hours window? It's, uh, nine. Yeah. Um, so let's do. Q time feels like a um, scout term of art. I am interpreting it as meaning something like the delay between when a job is added to Sidekick in this case and when that job processes, but um, or something along those lines. I'm not actually sure about that. So my instincts, which are possibly wrong. Mm -hmm. are that uh, the the uh, that queue time stands for what Heroku calls in router time. So like uh, Heroku, if you think about the Heroku infrastructure, and I'm using my mm -hmm. hands to pretend it's a whiteboard, requests come in and they hit the Heroku router and the Heroku router then sends them to particular dynos. If no dynos are available to take requests, like they're still occupied or whatever, the router will uh, just hold it in queue before sending it to a particular dyno. And I believe that that is what they mean by queue time. That makes could be wrong. more sense than my interpretation, though. Um, but they also have router. Yeah, that sounds like a place where we should look at the docs and ask what queue time even is. <sighs> that is a smart thing to do. Oops, and uh, we are we are thirty minutes in, um, so uh, I would like to uh, make a quick gut check to decide if we want to 
take a five minute break or a two minute break to kind of get our bearings or if we want to keep going on this path. How about we do this? Thumbs up if you want to keep going, thumbs down if you want to take a quick break. I think I want to keep going. I'm worried I'm going to fall over, but I feel like I'm in the middle of a thought right now. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for giving me space to run that check on myself. <laughs> what is scout Q time? Uh, what if we make a space between Q and time? Um, I'm sorry for accidentally zooming in. I accidentally invoked Linux's accessibility oh, features by trying to open a new tab. This is fascinating. Uh, How do I make it stop? I do not know. I'm going to Google that in a different window. Cool. Uh, so do you have any idea what key combination you may have pressed? I pressed Command-T, which probably maps to Alt-T. Uh, all right. Desktop magnification. You can hit super D appears to be, or control F6. So it appears to be, uh, it appears to be part of their accessibility mm -hmm. features. And the default might be control F6 or control F7. So I'm gonna try and do that. Cool. Nope. Uh, control or how about super D? Nope. Uh, I'm gonna switch to an empty window to try and solve this. One second. And also, um, this will be cut from the future recording, just because it's not super useful. So, come on. Uh, what is this called? Comp is config settings accessibility. No. Uh, settings. No. Sorry, everyone. This is what happens when computers do things. Uh, window manager, that feels right. Word. Uh, let's look for zoom. In or out? No. Focus. Might be under accessibility rather than window manager. I looked there and there wasn't anything there. Huh. So... This is weird. Oops. No, that's resize window. Uh... Crap. Um, how did I, this is, an, this is annoying, enhanced zoom desktop, Ubuntu 18.04, X Ubuntu zoomed into zoom out of accessibility. Oh, this is frustrating. Uh, if you want to keep poking at this, I will figure out how that all works. So I just dropped a link in for request queuing. If that's helpful if you're when you're back on that. Yeah, so Thank how about you. you try and keep things forward while I start debugging Betsy and Jackson, uh, if that's all right. Sounds that great. Can stay um, thank you for the link, Jackson. Mm -hmm. I'm going to paste that in. I'm going to actually paste that in by remembering how to paste cross VNC. Found it. Found it. Uh, it is super plus scroll wheel. That, that zooms in and zooms you out. So if you're, you hold down the command key and scroll down, it zooms. If you hold command and scroll out, it shrinks. Excellent. Oh, all right. And we're back. <laughs> And we don't have cross paste, so I am going to up that apm .scout app com. Yeah, it's just hashtag request dash queuing. 
It's the URL. That is interesting that it uses its hash right there. All right. Time it takes for your request to reach your Rails app from farther upstream, such as a load balancer or a rem server. This appears in Scout as request queuing, which looks equivalent to queue time, but they haven't updated their docs to match that. Um, I'm saying mm -hmm. that because, one, it's in the same place on the screen. Two, it's using the same color. Um, large request queuing time is an indication that your need app needs more capacity. Great. We have identified what that even is. And right. we are noting that it is the largest factor and that when we take it out of the picture, active record is the biggest factor, which also matches our assessment that there are too many database writes during these periods. The interesting thing, if we look at it, is the request per minute goes down? Oh no, that's the that is the effective throughput. That is not that is not the requested throughput. That is the effective throughput. I'm guessing. And the it's effective like, throughput is going down because it's trying to service these really expensive requests. Yeah, and they they start early on. Okay. So it looks like cool. Moments controller is our hotspot there. Moments controller create is our hotspot there. I'm doing a few more spot checks, but I noticed moments controller in the logs as well. So I'm going to guess that hitting moments controller create is fairly likely to be our problem. That is interesting. Um, did we look at the moments controller? I don't feel like I looked at the moments controller create last time we poked. No, we didn't. That is it's good to know. Because in general, um, our N plus one is the is the moments controller index that mm. is the slowest. So, so Betsy, um, is if I understand you correctly, what you're suggesting is that um, these creates are are locking, right? Like we're we're basically blocking those out because the database isn't allowed to get the writes in, and because that's failing, the eventual reads start to fail as well. Yeah. And so, it appears that there is some amount of relationship between publishing of moments and the system going down. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I'm wondering about there is if those moments are taking a while to create and they're potentially performing a read lock or something during mm -hmm. that time, that could be, uh, that doesn't actually make sense when I say it out loud. Well, y you may be onto something there because some to add some color to what happens when that's uploading is that if like if we think about the the book subscription side of things, uh, and this may may happen in parallel and may not be an issue, but it when you're that moment is added, then it creates these background jobs to then go ahead and like add that photo to a book subscription to all the book subscriptions that it belongs to, uh, and so there's other things that are happening other than the moment just being uploaded and hitting the feed, if, if that helps. Okay, that so... does help, but that doesn't necessarily seem like it would directly create some of the issues we're seeing. Um, that's some avenue we could pursue, but my instinct is that if the, because if we're putting those in a queue, um, then by definition, they're not part of the cycle time, or uh, the request time that uh, Scout is logging for that mm -hmm. request. Mm -hmm. um, so there is likely to also be something else that is expensive about that request. Um, I, I agree with that. My thoughts, I'm wondering if there's a transaction that's yeah. holding all of those and failing to close, and that's Ooh. causing it to happen. So we do have access to the code base, and it is pulled down into the application. It Feels like maybe it's time to start looking at some, uh, yeah. maybe the moments controller create code. Yeah, and Jackson, actually, right as we're doing that, can I have guesses as to what a moment is in the context of the application domain, but could you illuminate that for me? Sure, yeah. Uh, so from a user perspective, a moment is anything that it's, a, it's adding a photo, video, quote, audio moment, or written note. 
And so there's five different moment types. And so uh, a moment is the description, the catch all for those five types. Okay. Got it. So is this it... where I should sing the From This Moment So Long As Your Mind song? No. <laughs> um, hi, Z. For the um, piece of Z and B trivia, um, we actually met at R Madison Ruby Karaoke um, singing Defying mm. Gravity or something like that. That feels about right. Well, very drunk, so I did not do well. Um, but anyway. Uh, all right, so here we are in our moments controller. What are we looking for? What are we looking at? Um, we are looking at the create. Um, okay. I am not seeing any create, so I'm hoping that the base controller has some create logic in it. It's being inherited. Um, you might need to, so you know how you did that thing where you like dragged the user interface around? I think oh. we might have to... Undrag it? Oh god. I'm uh, sorry. Maybe... Here, let me, let me try and bring our user interface back to a workable state. Thank you, Z. There we go. As you can probably tell, I'm a sublime user normally. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was like, oh, what should I install to get this working? And then no, I Adam is Adam. fine. I just... <laughs> It's so like Sublime that I expect it to act actually like Sublime, and then it doesn't, and then I get sad. Mm -hmm. All right. So, is there a create method in here, perhaps? I do not see one. What are you inheriting from? From JSON API resource controller. That looks promising. Uh, for some definitions of promising, I would agree with you. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm now that I'm looking at this again, I'm remembering that on the 26th, when everything was over, uh, we did see these JSON API resource controllers doing things, but we had no idea. Like, uh, but it's 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 pulled in from a gem, so we don't have so the source code isn't necessarily super easy to browse. Uh, excuse me, but we should be able to do it. Um, it's core is what it's called. Sorry. No problem. Um, and what's the name of the gem? Uh, JSON resource, I feel like. Or JSON resources. This feels like we could open up a gem file and look it up exactly rather than guessing. Yeah, JSON API dash resources on oh, yeah. thirty two there. All right. All right, so where did it open to? It probably opened to, uh, it might it might not be opening correctly because of how X Windows works. Okay. So let's open a new tab, uh, file, open tab. Oh, because it's... we're in Tmux, right, thank you. Yeah, cool. So now we are in JSON API resources 0.7.0. I would request that we move this to our fourth workspace so that we can quickly swap back to our terminal by switching workplaces. There we Sounds go. Good. And, and there we go. Cool. Linux so is amazing, everyone. Just FYI. What is amazing? Linux, because you can like do these cool things. Where you're like, I want this to be on this workspace, and then to switch between workspaces, you can like you can hit some keyboard shortcuts, or you can click the little thing, and you can organize your stuff and manage your attention. Anyway, short pitch: use Linux. It's amazing. I'm going um, to look up what the exact class name we're looking for is again. JSON API resource controller. You look like include JSON API acts as resource controller. Mm -hmm. 
I have been known to call this the maze of twisty objects all alike pattern. That sounds accurate to me. Uh, can you can you expand on what you mean by that and like why you're recognizing that as the pattern here? So, um, a lot of the times when people discover that they can organize their code by moving it into separate files, they decide to get very neat and organized about it. And like, this is a useful learning stage that helps many projects, and I don't mean to slam it. Um, but its failure mode is people spending more time and effort on defining an organizational structure than on writing the actual code. And so if you're in one of those code bases, you tend to spend a lot of time navigating that organizational structure to find where a method is actually called. That, that sounds uh, pretty reasonable to me. Um, cool. So where next? Access resource controller, where we see an actual create method, which is cool. Um, mm -hmm. It's delegating to process requests, which, all right. Um, so now we're getting into some actual code. Um, so we're creating a request object um, that slurps up interesting stuff about the request context um, and some things called key formatter and server error callbacks, which I am tentatively assuming are um, instance methods that can be overridden at the controller level. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, can, processing can we, can we that. prove that? Sure. Uh, so, like, can we look figure out where key formatter and context are defined in this particular? Uh, this. So, I'm assuming that key formatter and context are defined in this class, and we can look for a def context or something. Yeah. Uh, did it not find anything? I was uh, right. in Kynan project rather than because I was less optimistic than you are um, about. <laughs> but I think I can do a find in buffer. <laughs> All right, so that's something that can be overridden. Okay, so that appears to be configuration y things. Oh, okay. That looks like you can configure the key format and the route, like formatting stuff. Got it. Okay, cool. Sorry, we can return to your to your thread. I was just not quite as oriented as you were. No, that's reasonable. Um, and it's totally reasonable for you to go. That's your guess, Betsy. I need to un actually understand this, <laughs> um, because a lot of the a lot of the reason I. Like previously you have commented on the fact that I tend to go through the OODA loop a lot faster than you. A lot of that is I am making very provisional observations and orientations and then using the decide act part to validate whether I've in fact guessed correctly or not. Mm -hmm. um, so that I can minimize the amount of stuff that is in my head at any given time versus the amount of stuff that is on screen. Um, one thing so that- let's, let's move out of the meta conversation and back to the code. Cool. Sorry, I just want to keep us focused for our for our, our potential viewers eventually. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, so process request. What's going on here, and what do you think we should do? Let's look at what create operations processor is doing. Um, create operations processor. There's a... We, and this can be configured or there's a default. Let's look and see if one has been configured. And I'm going to do so by searching for operations processor. Uh, two S's? Yeah. In the base project, no results. Cool. So we're just dealing with the default one. 
Do we want to look for JSON API configuration too, just to figure out if it's possible that it's configured differently based upon writing the configuration versus reading? I am not very trusting. Um, That's reasonable. All right, that's interesting. It appears to be we're reading the configuration. But we're not actually there, writing. Can we look for JSON API dot and see if we're making any JSON API dot whatever calls? Because I don't know if you configure JSON API by calling configuration or if you call dot configure. Aha, you do, you call dot configure. All right. Cool, and so we're allowing record not unique errors, which matches the rescue from we are seeing in the moments controller. So, we're hand so my guess is that we're probably handling those manually. Um, and we're setting the maximum page size, but other than that, we're not really doing anything. Okay. So we can tentatively assume, this is Ruby, we can't do anything permanently, but we can tentatively assume that probably we're using the default operations processor. So uh, before we do that, I would like to raise the question of, do we want to keep diving down and continue doing a depth first search of debugging, or do we want to stay and do broader like context building still? Because I think we're, it's, I think it's fine to go either way, but I want to make that a decision group as a, a collectively as a group instead of uh, diving down directly. That makes sense. Um, the reason. I, my instinct is to dive down directly is I still don't know what's actually writing to the database. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to try to figure out where the database writes are occurring because database writes appear, appear to be the proximate problem. OK, cool. So then we've got two paths we can look down. We can look, at the op we can look for the operations processor, or we can look at this weird JSON API request class. Yeah, um, and your and if I understand you correctly, your 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 best guess, your hypothesis is that the operations processor is probably where the create calls are going to be. Yeah, so if we can figure out how that works. Uh, we should be good. And this yep. little this little pattern here. So like, if you're a Ruby programmer and you've seen like dot new get called on a not a class, you if you've never seen a Ruby method or dot new be called on a thing that's not a class, this might look really weird to you. Um, and I agree, it is weird looking. But what I believe my guess is that's happening is this function here is returning a class itself that will become instantiated. Is that match what you're expecting it to do, Betsy? That's matching my expectation. Um, and this is a perfectly reasonable form of dependency injection. And my guess is that this allows for really flexible configuration in cases where you want to override JSON API's default behavior, which we are likely to want to do so during the course of the pairing session. So that's good to know. Cool. All right. So I will I will I will take off the brakes and let you uh, let you no, fly forward you. again. <laughs> thank you for backing up. Um, include callbacks. Define include callbacks. That's interesting to me. Define JSON API resources callback. Huh. So this might, so thinking? I'm not 100% sure what these things are. I want to look in the date. I don't think I care what they are for the moment, but I'm guessing the solution to this is going to involve looking up the documentation for them because my best guess as to what they probably are is um, a bunch of hooks for hooking into the lifecycle of a JSON API request as it's being processed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be a better alternative to forgetting to the heart of things than just brute force rewriting or um, overriding and re-implementing. OK. Um, and I'm guessing that the file named operationsprocessor.rb is likely to be the default operations processor, but I do want to flag that as a guess that I am making to save time rather than yeah. something I'm certain of. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, but I agree with you that it is probably the default, so I'm not too worried about that just yet. Ah, all right, so process, this is, is process the method that's getting called in the uh, yeah. previous tab that disappeared on us? Yes. 
Okay. Um, so we're setting up some stuff. Request.operations is interesting. Um, so it looks like we're Do use transactions if more than one operation and if one of the operations can be transactional. Even if transactional, transactions won't be used unless the derived operations processor supports them. That sounds like a piece of logic we will want to revisit at some point during here. Yeah, because uh, what is the, the, the this, this syntax here, Betsy? Is that the, that, it looks like or equals to me, but it's not, it's something I else. think it's a bit shift um, of some kind. Oh, so if transactional is false. Yeah. Or if transactional is false, it may be overridden by operation.transactional. Yeah. But if it is true, it will not be overridden back to false. Is that your expectation of what happens? <sighs> That's my guess. Um, especially given what the comment is saying. Mm -hmm. But okay. I don't want to rely on that. I don't want to rely on that guess being accurate. I don't think we need to know that right now. Um, mm -hmm. If we do wind up needing to know that, I'm going to look up exactly the behavior of that operator. That sounds reasonable. Um, run callbacks, operations... Is operations a defined callback? Do I need to know what callbacks are right now? I'm worried that I may start needing to in a minute. Well, let's let's not worry about callbacks just yet, because my guess is the callbacks are a seam that can be yeah. overridden and then used at the consumer of JSON API resources level. And if that is the case, I don't believe that any of our moments controller create assigns any callbacks. I could be completely wrong, though. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want to state that as a true assertion for truth. Um, and we're now dealing, diving into deep abstraction land. And with all of this operations, meta operations, links type stuff, I'm going to, hy I'm going to make a hypothesis about what an operation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like you to add to this working hypothesis um, if you have thoughts. But my guess is that an operation is something that is derived from the... Like, the, the operations are derived from the request object. And my mm -hmm. guess is an operation is something small and concrete like save this, re save this model. Uh, it might be. <laughs> cool. Uh, right now, like the the layer of abstraction that is JSON API's operation, JSON API resources operation system is I have no real visibility into it. Um, yeah. But that sounds like a reasonable interpretation to me. My one caveat is that uh, I think. I, I think we probably want to be focused on, so this is, are these before? Like how do, when does yeah. the operation execute is my question. Is it, because I would expect that an operation would have some function. Oh no, here it is, process operation. That should give us more information. I'm also Oops. wondering if now is the appropriate time to look at the docs and see what they think these things are. Uh, yeah, so we should be able to do that via Google. So keep in mind our version is 0.7.0. 0. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, JSON API, API resources, uh, docs. Boop, boop, ba -da -da -doo -doo. All right, so the latest release appears to be 0. 0.9.5. So uh, I don't know if the production documentation will be up to date, but hopefully it will give us enough of context that we can make intelligent decisions about what the heck is going on. Uh, 
learn more, maybe? <gasps> Operation processors. Um, I have a great idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <gasps> no! <laughs> that will be closer. <laughs> Oh, my heart breaks. My heart breaks. I'm actually really, I'm actually overjoyed at the fact that whoever maintains this is a wonderful human being because they let you select your version from a drop down. I, I love them to death for the rest of my life because they give us that affordance, even if it doesn't have 0 0.7. So this is beautiful. <laughs> That's fair. Like, this is already doing a great deal better than the average. It is true. All right, that looks like a processor, not an operation. Yeah. Our call to perform the operations that make up our request. Probably this is a basic concept that's likely to be in the introduction. Or not. Or basic usage. We have a single demo op called Peeps. That is exciting. I wonder if operations are intended to be an internal concept and not a concept that is used externally and that we theoretically uh, should feel comfortable relying on 0 0.7s, or sorry, relying on the operation processors system. Does that sound reasonable? That sounds reasonable to me. Um... So that tells me we might want to bump up or yeah. sideways? Uh, I like that idea. Um, I'm going to look at what operations appear to be first, just really quickly. <gasps> Find operation. We have a name that involves like words I understand outside of the context of this gem. Mm hmm. Apply. So I'm no assuming operation. that the apply method, I'm assuming the, sh the apply method is the thing that does the majority of the work of marshalling the data for either read or write. Um, but I could be wrong there. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Show relationship operation. These are all looking really promising. I think you're correct that it's an internal concept, see? Whoops. Uh, we just passed the create resource operation, which Thank maybe you. is fine. Uh, I think you want to do command F to find in file, or control F, rather. Yeah, find in buffers control F. Okay, so it looks like it's just a default resource class dot create. So is 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 my understanding then that for the moments controller, the resource class we hope to infer is a moment object. Yeah. That moment object is created and depending on whether or not if we go back to our was it operation processor yeah if we go back to where to go uh transaction yeah so if we go back to here process operation goes here calls with default handling i don't know what that does oh it just yields apparently unless there's an exception and then it does fancy cool stuff and then calls apply so assuming this is all playing nicely, uh, the moments controller, m my expectation of it is that the create method cr creates a single creates a single operation, one of those create operations that you had, mm -hmm. and applies it at once. We can also verify this. I think there's a, a, a our spec test for the create uh, moments create controller, so we could mm -hmm. instrument this with some logging and or debugging or whatever and, and run it. Yeah. Um, but this, and then that probably kicks off, if I had to guess, and I am not a betting man, but I'm willing to bet this moment controller has a callback. Uh-huh. After create or before create or... 
or something Nothing along those lines. After destroy. Hmm. I'm also interested in so that replace data method that was uh, called in create method? operation or replace. Uh, you might. Let's Can you navigate to what you're saying? Talk about. Yeah. Uh. Replace fields. Uh, what is okay? That's interesting. Yeah. Is that built into Active Record? No. Or it's not. Um, built, it's not in Moment. Um, that's a good question. If it's built into Active Record. Also, we have spent about an hour getting oriented here. Um, I think, yeah. I think it's I think it's correct that we spent this amount of time, but it, we have been going relatively deep along a yeah. single trajectory. Um, so, given that it's been about thirty minutes of focusing on this particular trajectory, I'd like us to come to a decision about what change we'd like to make within the next five to ten minutes, um, so that we can spend at least thirty to forty-five minutes applying a change and seeing seeing what happens. Uh, is that a reasonable request? That is. Um, unfortunately, I'm still... I agree with your assessment that from a pure time perspective, we need to be moving out of the orient phase and into the decide and act phases. Mm -hmm. I... am... Just, Unfortunately, just, it's I don't. Fine to say whatever you oriented. want to say. What's that? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't feel very oriented. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's 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 definitely a big like. Uh, we spend a lot of time in a very scary spot, uh, not a scary spot, but like a very, uh, a very deeply complex spot, right? Like the JSON API resources gem is pretty complex from a, uh, yeah, from that perspective, and. Notably itself is a five-year-old application with real-world like clients on it, so like it's it's also pretty complex. Um, what if instead of making a decision right now, we pop back up? At, what if we what if we just kind of discuss for a second about how we feel yeah. about or sorry, not how we feel, but where we would like to spend our time orienting ourselves for the next ten to fifteen minutes? That makes um, a lot of and, sense. Um, I'm going to say. that right now I am extremely weirded out that the APM is calling this particular endpoint out as problematic. Um, okay. Because I feel like even though I don't necessarily feel very oriented in total, from mm -hmm. what I have seen so far, I feel like I have a decent, like right now I have enough information that I have a potential complete mental model in my head, mm -hmm. but I don't, but the reason I don't, the reason I don't feel oriented isn't because I don't have a mental model. It's because I have something that feels like a relatively complete mental model, which is that the actual processing of data that connects to the database is nothing more than the moment and any after create callbacks, which there aren't any, like mm -hmm. those are the only things that are being modified in this API endpoint. Mm -hmm. And I am feeling a great deal of dissonance between that, which seems relatively simple to me, um, and 
the fact that this is taking an extremely large amount of time because those two so things when you say this do you mean the request processing this particular endpoint is taking a really large lar amount of time and it's also fundamentally only performing one write and that's a write that at least looking at the context if from my memory of the context in the moments controller which i'd like to now refresh myself on mm -hmm. um and let's also look in base controller From my memory, yeah, so that's, I'm sorry. From my memory, yeah. So, so like from what's actually going on, it like doesn't seem like that complex an operation. It seems like exactly one query is being performed, and that query is not sufficient. And I'm concerned because it really does seem like only that one query is being performed. That this could be a dead. End, and that we're thinking about this the wrong way. Um, one of the things now that I'm thinking out loud that I wonder about is, is there a reason this particular insert query is particularly expensive? Maybe because there's a lot of indexes on this table. Um, so I think one next of the, my next orientation thing is looking at the schema just to see so if there's... Let's, let's... Yeah. Let's pause for just a second because yeah. you, you just made a decision there about what you want to orient next. I'd like oh, us to yeah. not make a decision yet. So okay. so it's okay if like so so right now one of the possibility possible decisions we're going to make is to explore the database schema and see if there's things like weird indexes or whatever that would make moment writes expensive from a database perspective. And I think that is a really good possible next step, but I'd like us to just not take the step just yet. Yeah. Cool. Are there other things that could like, cause, cause that's going back down into the spelunking, right? Cause yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah. spelunking down in, but another we thing, might also want to pull up or go sideways in our explorations. Another thing that we could do, um, would be to more quickly prove either way that there is only one, um, insert query happening per request. Right now it seems like that from the code, but I don't have a... I don't trust that understanding. I don't think spelunking further into JSON API resources is likely to provide me with confidence there, certainly not on, within the amount of time that we have. And okay. so I think that we might want to try an alternate strategy for verifying that, possibly like you were mentioning earlier, um, adding some kind of instrumentation and using these specs to verify our understanding. I think that the instrumentation I would like to do there would be um, probably tailing the test logs for um, SQL queries rather than any explicit instrumentation within JSON API resources. Because mm -hmm. I'm less concerned with the mechanics of what gets called where than the absolute result. So to restate what I believe you are saying, yeah. we're pretty confident that JSON API resources is not doing anything untoward. Right, yeah. like it is, it is behaving correctly, and diving further into it seems like a, a red herring. And I, I agree yeah. with you there. Um, so let's, uh, so we have one other. So so let's discard that as a possible decision for where we're going to head next. So now we have option A is look at the database uh, and look if there's any kind of schema indications that may give it, that may be interesting. Um, I think it might be worth popping. Uh, popping out of the code uh, like so so if you if you think about like what we're doing from the okay, the context of you know a Russian doll kind of thing we've got like the outermost Russian doll which is the applicant the user personally working on the application and seeing a bad thing happen and we've got a bunch of internal Russian dolls like we've got you know, the, the network layer is another Russian doll inside of the application, right? There's the person using the app. There's the app is a Russian doll inside of that. Mm -hmm. Inside of that is a network layer, which is a Russian doll. And they just keep on, you know, pop, 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 pop. Mm -hmm. um, and we've decided, so I would like to think about some of the Russian dolls that are either siblings of JSON API in the application controller or parents of, uh, of what we're doing so that we, we don't keep going down from our Russian doll of the, the controller into into things because I feel like that's 
like my guess is this is an interdependency issue where a thing starts being a problem and then many other things start becoming a problem, right? Like there's uh, the uh, the IOPS are out and so yeah. everything slows down, right? Like that was the the cause of the the fallover, and so maybe we need to look sideways at a higher level. And I just don't know which level we should be yeah. looking at. Um, but that feels more useful to me than diving into a particular controller context. That makes so a what great do you think about that? That makes a great deal of sense. Um, yes, ending that, one thing I'm wondering about now. Um, Jackson mentioned earlier that there are background jobs fired up off on moment creation. Mm-hmm. I previously dismissed that as the cause of our troubles um, because my hypothesis was that background jobs aren't going to contribute to the amount of time that we're in the controller action because they're inherently background jobs. Mm -hmm. But one thing I'm now wondering about, given that the problem is overall database write performance and overall database load, is if we're seeing a bunch of requests that insert into the moments table, and that also have background jobs that touch the moments table. I'm wondering if that could be creating knock-on request, knock-on effects for subsequent creates, not necessarily the first one, but just database writes are getting overall slower because we're thrashing the database with a lot of, of writes, period. Mm -hmm. And so that's causing and so that combination could be interesting potentially in terms of giving us the results we're seeing mm -hmm. um i don't think this hypothesis means necessarily anything different in terms of the instrumentation i would want to look at although it would mean that i would also want to um, before we ran our spec for instrumentation purposes, I would want to look into when and how um, active jobs were being executed um, in the context of tests um, so that I had a good sense of what SQL queries were the result of a sidekick job versus what SQL queries were the result of um, the controller request itself. OK, so I really like what you're saying here. Um, I think that instead of diving into the tests, we might want to go back to our observa ob observa bleh, 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 or observation stack mm -hmm. to figure out if we can get paper trail or, or scout or something to kind of like group the queries that like group the queries by like structure, not by uh, data that has been inserted into the query. Yeah. Uh, to see if there's a pattern there, uh, because I, I agree with you. Like if we run the tests and we have our our SQL logs coming out, like that's going to give us some information. But like because as you mentioned, the background jobs just might not run because it's in the test, right? Or we might have stubbed out these things. Then we might not have that information to go with. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. So we've got two options for where we go next. One is to bump way back up and go to our observability and try and get an idea of the, the, the writes to the database and the reads to the database within this time window. And I really like that idea. Um, and the other is to look at the database schema and figure out if there's anything that jumps out at us that might be causing writes or reads or writes to the moments controller or reads to the moment controller to be more expensive. And I'm happy to do either of those things because I think they're both really good ideas. I'd like to look at the schema first because that will help me contextualize the work we do in the observability tools. Awesome. Let's do that. Um, yeah, so this is using, uh, what's it called? A structure.sql. Uh, so it's not using a standard Rails schema.rb file where we're translating the database schema into a DSL. It's using a 
um, database definition language dump. Um, All right, so I think the PostgreSQL create table syntax is the same. So if we search for create table moments, it should play nicely. Yep. Um, this yes. does mean we need to be careful about looking at where indexes are because the indexes may or may not be grouped in the ways that we would expect from schema.rb file. Yeah, we'll have to look for create, I think it's create index um, yeah. when we look for those. Okay, so we have a UUID, UUI generate before not null. I feel like that's a fast operation, but I'm not yeah, actually... That's built into Postgres, Yeah, uh, and it happens really, really fast. It's an extension, so it should be good. One, uh, one thing I did notice earlier that is not related to this, and I don't want us to pursue it necessarily, is that I saw that data ID was being munged in the uh, the handler for the exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I think what it was doing is it was changing the ID and reinserting the... Uh, but that, that may be not related to this, so I think it's fine. Excuse me, fine to just move on. Cool. So you got a user ID there that's not null. None of these look expensive from my perspective. Nothing looks funky to me here either. Uh, so how do, this. Yeah, so we might need to just find an index because I do not remember the syntax. I think it's I think you're right that it's create index. Create okay, index. so yeah, if we look for on moments maybe. Hey, we've got indexes. On created at how expensive are gate indexes in Postgres? Do you remember? Um, on write, they're very inexpensive, but this is using a, uh, do you know if uh, the B tree, is that the default for date indexes or is this I a custom? I feel like, like that's the name of the algorithm, so. Well, yeah, but like uh, when we when we create a, when we insert a record, it's cause it's calling the B tree al algorithm to do the parsing of the index, right? So I'm just curious if that's expensive or not. Um, What's this moment sync stuff? Do you know? Uh, that is, I don't believe that is part of the moments controller uh, uh, insertion flow. Okay. But it could be. Um, Index moment so on encoding status. Okay, that's, I think, a moment, uh, does it include the, no, it doesn't tell us the type. Yeah. But all of those look really normal. Like, none of these look like we're creating some, like, PostgreSQL view table or anything like that. This all looks, like, pretty, pretty There's standard There's a compound stuff. index, but it doesn't look like a terrible one either. Yeah. And we're now into moments users, so I don't yeah. feel like we're... We're in a big deal here. I'm okay. going to just do a I think this is the trigger syntax, but um I just want to sanity check that there are no like triggers on create or anything that would Okay. Uh, uh, did you do an on insert? I didn't notice. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right, and uh so, so we've got the schema, and it doesn't, from my read, doesn't look like any of the creates should be that expensive of a yeah. Moment. Um, so let us see. We can either go back up to the to Scout and kind of dive into a few different requests and see what's going on inside of those, or we could uh, we could look at uh, AWS and see if AWS gives us any like transaction logs or something that say, hey, this query or this transaction took a long time and this is why, and it gives you a list of the queries or something. Um, yeah. Or we could try and figure out, so Jackson said, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jackson, uh, that when we create a moment, there are background jobs that get kicked off. Um, we didn't see that in our code. So... 
is there something watching for those moments and like doing a select asterisk from moments where created at is greater than something or other? Because if it's if it's happening later after create, that could still be a problem if it's like a background job doing the find moments and then insert new work. So my thought about how we find those is looking in the jobs folder and then doing a find in project for any jobs. Okay. Uh, Jackson is typing. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, he's, he's pointing down. I don't know. Oh, because he's telling us to look at chat. He's. Oh, you think you're muted. Oh, because, yeah, we can't hear you at all. Oh, no. We're sorry, Jackson. Uh, I'm. Try talking now. Nope. Uh, maybe your microphone just puked out. I'm sorry. Um. <sighs> uh, well, I guess uh, that's that's unfortunate, but I think it's best to just move on, and I'll just keep looking at chat and see if you say things. Um, I did notice your your link to Scout, um, which or that the screenshot of Scout, which was pretty useful. Uh, moment sync. So moment sync, from what I understand, is a way for you to, for any moments that you've uploaded, have them exported to Dropbox at some point. Um, at some point, or? Uh, or uh, at the time the moment is created, or thereabouts? Um, I think, oh, here. That's interesting. This looks like a moments where okay, so so I think moment syncs are happen on a on a schedule. Yes, yes. So moment sync, if I remember correctly, is that it is a feature that is no longer active. Mm -hmm. um, what we could do, actually, now that I think about this, is we could look at Sidekick and oh, get an idea for which jobs are happening a lot, and that, that will sense. allow us to triangulate this way easier. All right, so sidekick, sidekick, how the heck does this work? Activity, not activity notifier job looks like the most frequent here, and I'm seeing this activity moment business that looks promising. Okay, so maybe activity notifier job is getting kicked off by something. Uh, uh, there it is, line, the second one. And and that job might be doing a where. Yeah, or I want to see what's queuing it. Ooh, lots of things, including the moment resource. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if my inclination that the moment resource was the model is wrong, or sorry, that the the resource class was a model is wrong, and it's actually a moment resource that has the the that is that is uh, doing the after creator stuff. I think that that's absolutely correct. And I'm seeing after replace fields, authorize, create, before create, set user, after create, create activity, we have hit the mother Lindsay. Yay! I am no longer it. extraordinarily confused by a, by <laughs> what a simple right is. <laughs> so, so to update my mental model of JSON resource, which is a new library to me, mm -hmm. it, it decouples the model from the JSON API model and provides a, it appears to provide a little wrapper for API driven kind of events so that you don't have to pollute your, your, your core model, your application model with stuff that is predominantly API related. Mm -hmm. um, that feels pretty good to me. Um, I think that, it, so GraphQL Ruby provides a similar functionality with their, uh, their object types. So this, this feels, I'm, I'm no. I'm. I'm with you. I'm not as. I'm not as freaked out anymore. So this. Yeah. Is <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so there's that update storybooks. My mic works again. Um, that update storybooks. By the way, that's the process of adding that moment to any books. And to go back real quick, moment sync. You're correct. That was a thing that we were syncing to Dropbox, but that feature is no longer active. Okay. Yeah, you're back. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been muted? I'm sorry about that. No worries. It's good for me to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> so, I'm sure your input would have been useful. 
do we want to look at any of these before create or after create functions before we start looking at uh, yeah. inserts and stuff? My guess, based on what Jackson was saying earlier, is that they mostly kick off jobs. Um, but let's verify that. And if I recall that, unless that unless you're seeing that that happens on every moment upload, uh, I think there might be a case where that is something that's run every like ten minutes or something to bring them all in. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's happening on every create okay. of a moment. So we've got, let me, if we go back here to the top, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's a list of callbacks and I want to make really, I want to make sure I understand what's happening. So before create, we call set user and set happened at. After create, we call create activity and update encoding status. And before, after save, we call update share URL and update storybooks. And do you know uh, if before update, is that part of the, is that only on updates or is that also on creates, Betsy? Because I don't remember from the active record callback chain. Um, before update is only on updates, not on creates. Before save is the equivalent for both. Mm -hmm. And then this after replace fields, I'm guessing that's get called by JSON resources because we saw that replace fields method that we searched yeah. for earlier. And I'm willing to bet that this gets called. So every create, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven callbacks that are fired off uh, when a resource is created, a moment is created via the API. Does that match what you're seeing, Betsy, or am I just yep. making shit up? And at All least right. one of them updates storybooks, um, cues a sidekick job. I'm going to check create activity. Two. That also has a activity notifier job. I think it looks like all the callbacks are clustered here in this early private bit. Mm -hmm. Update encoding status might perform an in request write. Yeah, that feels like it might be an in request write. It actually live updates the UI with that encoding status. So that might be part of the process. So. Update encoding status, when is it called in the callback chain, Betsy? Do you remember when that was? Is it after save or before save or something like that? I think that was after update, and my guess is... Whoops. No, it's after create. Okay. Um, what does... What do you do? Still, I'm not necessarily too concerned about that because I'm looking at this add photos to storybooks job. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about what I saw earlier in terms of storybooks. And do you mind me following this thread, Z, or do you rather I be more organized and systematic? Um, I would like to reflect what I believe are current possible okay. downs are before we follow this one. So okay. uh, we can either go down the stack and look into add photos to storybook job. We can go down the stack and look into update encoding status uh, to see if that does any writes. Um, we can go, uh, and is that an after create? I feel like it's an after create. That's an after create. Okay. Or we could go, where else could we go? Is that, are those are only two ones at this point? I feel like those are the only two ones. If you can't think of one if I yeah. immediately off the top of your head. All right. So I am totally down with going down either of those paths or spending a little bit of time trying to find other paths to go down. I'll leave it up to you to decide. I'm thinking Storybooks is the most promising, but I want you to validate that instinct. The reason okay. it's the most uh, promising is that earlier when we were kind of skimming the jobs, mm -hmm. one thing I noticed was that Storybooks generated a PDF. Mm -hmm. Um. If it's generating a PDF, my guess is that it's performing a relatively expensive read query in order to do so. Mm -hmm. And since That's... one of the things we're looking for is things that might be thrashing the database 
and causing these writes to be slow. Oh, but now that I say it out loud, it's not going to be an in. It's not going to be something that really kills write performance, and that's the thing well, that I'm really worried about. So, so keep in mind that uh, the way that AWS allocates its 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 operations per second yeah, is yeah. they just bucket them all into ops, right? So every okay. IOP, whether it's a write or a read, you know, takes 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 up IOPS. Okay. Um, so uh, while we're seeing spikes in our write IOPS causing this fall down, um, I think I think you're right that that is going to be a problem. A problem that could be a problem later on. Um, but I also think you're right that because it's not, it doesn't seem like it would do a lot of writing, it's probably not a super useful path to go down. So I'm okay with discarding it or jumping in depending on your, your thoughts. Let's look at the activity notifier instead. If we're looking for rights, activity notifier seems more right intensive i have one thing on each of those uh yeah on the storybook side of things one thing that could further validate is the idea that it's not necessarily an increased load of user uploads but certain users that have storybooks enabled um that if they're i think that could be causing some issues because it's not it doesn't correlate one-to-one -one with like when there's an increase in, in upload traffic there's we're more likely to tip over. There are times when it's not correlated with throughput. So I think it could be related to certain users that maybe have multiple viewers that are creating automatic books off of their moments that are causing mm -hmm. all these writes. Or on the activity job side of things, if you saw in the retries tab of Sidekick, there's an SNS failure that happens over and over and over. That's like our most common failure. And I'm Ooh. wondering if that retries, retries, retries all the time, and that's just causing an issue. Because also correlate that with some Android users that are not getting push notifications. Ooh, I really like that one. And that seems more consonant with additional rights. Mm -hmm. One of the things, one of the reasons I'm excited to see the ideas that Honeycomb is promulgating spread out more into the world um, is that one of the things their advertising copy claims to do is give you the ability to do things like cheaply correlate users to requests. And so we could see really quickly in that circumstance whether Jackson's theory about it primarily being users with storybooks enabled or users attached to users with storybooks enabled, we could validate that mm -hmm. really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, since we can't, we have to rely on guesswork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, let's. We've only got we've only got about eighteen minutes left before uh, I have to go start typing things for money instead of doing this for for fun and potential maybe future profit. Um, <laughs> so uh, since we only have that little time, uh, and I would like us to get at least one commit in. I, mm -hmm. I, I think we should look at the activity notifier job, see if there's any things that looks like it's writing, and uh, and then uh, make a commit that uh, that either on failure allows it to just keep on keeping on and just, wee, I'm done. I technically succeeded even though I failed, right? So we could rescue this SNS error invalid parameter. Or we can... Um, or we can do, or we can follow another path if we see in there, like, oh yeah, here we go, we're doing these silly updates. Because I seem to remember the last time I was looking at some of the jobs, they were reading a record from the database, creating follow-on jobs, and then updating their status back in the PostgreSQL database. And so we were like doing this kind of like read and then rapidly write kind of thing on job failure or on job execution, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that seemed like kind of a problem. Does that mm -hmm. sound good? That makes a lot of sense to me, Z. All right, let's do it. My hands are off the keyboard, by the way. All right, well, I'm going to do what I think you said, and you can correct me if I'm interpreting what you said wrong. Uh, I am very good at telling people, you didn't understand me. <laughs> um. OK, so I'm going to activity notifier job. Um, it's taking an 
arbitrary activity class. Um, in this case, probably some kind of moment creation thing. Mm -hmm. um, let me validate that by looking at the moment resource again. I really wish that uh, the auto close of buffer was focused on files you haven't used in a while instead of files that you just used but didn't make any changes in. I'm gonna Wouldn't send that, that out nice? to Adam as a feature request. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you hit Command P, you should be able to find files, or Control P, because it is a real computer, not a Mac. I'm oh, sorry, that, that was judgmental. This is a judgment-free zone. Um, <laughs> hmm. uh, so, yeah, okay. So. Create activity. I think you've already got it found in your find buffer, so you should be able to just hit find. Yeah. Oh, no, it got really yeah, small. How do I make the text tiny? How do I fix uh, it? Control Thank plus. You, Thank you, Z. Oh, no. All right, we're back. OK. So, act so form later, activity moment is the model in question. Mm -hmm. um, will you stay open? You probably won't stay open. But whatever, I'm going to go back to activity notifier job. So create activities. Each Create activities. That's interesting. Um, each check and notify. Um, so the other argument into perform, if we swipe back really quick, um, is a is the model itself. And if I look at this job, it looks like it is doing some kind of serialization of that model to store it in line with the with the thing. Cool. Yeah, um, active job by default does this really interesting global identifier thing to enable it to quickly slurp the. Which model is a read, back out right? of was that so it's so it's which is a read right because or, correct not right because what it does is it goes yeah. back to postgresql and says inflate me back from the database so that i can use you yes okay so let's go back to the activity right. notifier job all right so, so that is a yeah. list that we are passing as individual arguments to the create activities method, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Activity moment. We have activity moment, create activities moment, and then that's going to be the moment model itself as rehydrated from the database. An using interesting thing, if I, if I can be so bold, yeah. is each of these, these are requests into an active record relation, right? So it is querying Ooh, a where clause yeah. every time it does that particular line, or this particular line, or this particular operation, not line. Um, and those will eventually be cached but those are happening inside of the sidekick processor. So the sidekick processor is reaching into the database here, 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 possibly here, I don't know, and then definitely here. And it's also doing creates here. And it's running, and this may or may not be relevant. Um, it's running multiple threads, so I'm not actually sure that everything is going to have the same query cache. In fact, I think things may have separate query caches. Yes, they will definitely have separate query caches, and it's entirely possible that uh, these separate query caches uh, is so. So, Sidekick also does not guarantee that a single job happens, um, right? Like, it's it's the kind of thing that if it goes into the job queue, you might have five workers that pick that sucker up and then execute them as part of Sidekick's. Like, that's how they're fast. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's also possible this is happening multiple times because the workers are picking them up. Yeah which means that we're really thrashing the database with reads, but that still hasn't found us our rights. But now well, we're finding us our rights, and these... Uh, another thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you keep, keep thinking, but another thing that popped into my head is... The way that Sidekick handles failures is when a, when a job falls over, 
um, it will retry very, very quickly, right? And it's yeah. not going to wait, like, it's going to wait in milliseconds, not, you know, hours or whatever. So what could be happening is a job gets inserted into Sidekick. Sidekick, the job fails because Amazon SNS is like, screw you, like, we don't want, we don't, you gave us the wrong stuff. Sidekick's like, well, we're going to try again really, really fast. And so then we hit these queries and just like do a bunch of reads and a bunch of writes all at once. And we just keep reading and writing and reading and writing into the system. Um, sorry, that's, that, that yeah. may not be happening. But like, so here, here, we got this create bang. Um, and apologies if I'm just like driving super fast now. No, it's fine. So we don't have that much time. So this activity moment is is a child of activity so it's also possible that every time we do this create uh we're calling a oops we're calling acti we're calling some callbacks in here let's just verify that's not true okay that that appears to be false Excellent. oh wow filter recipients does a lot of loading of stuff too Whew. So right. my guess is that one thing that we can do to, at the very least, make this more performant, which may or may not solve the falling over problem, because I don't think we've proved that, I don't think we conclusively proved that this is the problem child. I think we have a lot of circumstantial evidence suggesting that mm -hmm. this is not helping. Mm -hmm. Um but not conclusively proved anything. One thing we can do as kind of a throw things at the wall to see what sticks mm -hmm. would be um, replacing some of this with a somewhat uglier but significantly more performant single SQL query so we're not thrashing the database nearly as hard. That feels like a really expensive action. Okay. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but it does seem like a really expensive action. And I, I think I'm, in, I'm aligned with Jackson here where like the issue appears to be cascade, like it starts to fall over and then we get a bunch of retries and those retries, like if we look at our failures, like there's 6,300 of them and they re enqueue themselves and throw themselves at the wall and we wind up with a with a with a with the with the server falling. And so down. you'd rather kill retries and we can figure out the cause of the errors later. Yeah, that feels that better reasonable. to me. That sounds reasonable um, to me. Cuz cuz then we can make a small step forward that may make yeah. their life slightly better. Um so let's put in a rescue for AWS SNS errors in the activity notifier job and return true and maybe throw a log, rails log error or something to say whoops this particular activity notifier failed sorry friends cool does that feel good that feels great and then we can do a search on the logs for how much this is an ongoing problem and what patterns are associated with it in the future yeah. the only two failures i really ever see in retries are this sns invalid parameter and intercom sync mm -hmm. Those are but the intercom, only two that happen to show up there. But intercom, I'm assuming you want to allow to happen again, right? Like, yeah, maybe I don't know. Or does it? If it doesn't happen last night and it happens tonight, does it catch up? Do we need it to try the same sync again, or is a sync a sync? Um, I don't know. I don't know anything about that, and that's probably too much for us to do in the next ten to fifteen minutes. Yeah, I just I really only bring it up just so if we're filtering on any kind of thing that that we would take into account that it could be one of those two, but it seems like SNS is much more probable to be the issue. All right. Uh, so do you want me to type, Betsy, or do you want to drive it forward? Uh, why don't you try, type? Do, do, and I will do, attempt to narrate. Do, do. All right. So, and I'm generally OK at understanding what's going on. Activity moment. So the moment sync fill job, that's not it. Uh, what is the name of our job we were looking at? Activity notifier job. There it is. And this is the perform. So I'm going to put a teeny tiny rescue. And then uh, what is the constant SNS colon colon? Yeah, Amazon. let's grab the exact thing from Sidekick. Oh, ye of little faith. OK, I was already wrong. <laughs> uh, command C. Did I? Oh, my goodness. What just happened? Control C. There we go. 
Control Shift left, Control V, E, not each. Uh, I guess in parameter error. Yeah. All right. So rails dot logger dot error. Uh, AWS SNS invalid parameter parameter. How do you? I it's right in front of me, and I still can't spell it. Uh, invalid parameter. Invalid parameter error dot message. Um, this is Ruby, not JavaScript. Um, it's oh uh, yeah, yeah, the Octothorpe. Yeah. Oops. And All parameters right, so spelled is... incorrectly. Where? Second instance uh, of it, Z. Ah, uh, thank you. Cool. So this feels like a thing that if you merge this into your code base, may alleviate the problem that you are experiencing. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? It sounds reasonable to me, and I think it is also unlikely to make the problem worse. And what do we expect to happen when when it logs these? Where are these being logged? They'll go into Paper Trail. Okay. Um, uh, they'll they will be in Paper Paper Trail, and the other nice thing is they will be uh, you'll be able to filter down to uh, the log entries that are done by this particular instance of this particular job happening. And does this restrict uh, Sidekick from try retrying? Yes. So now Sidekick, in the event that this happens, will take a step back and be like, that was successful, and walk away, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even though it failed. So okay. like, what we're basically telling Sidekick is we are willing to allow this exception to occur and that it shouldn't keep working through the problem. Does that seem right? Yep. OK. So this is one action that I think we should take. The other action, Jackson, I think we should reduce the amount of processors we give to the worker queue. Uh, so crank down those dynos, maybe not immediately after on, we commit this. On workers. Yes. Crank I think down we only have dynos. one dyno on workers. How big is it, though? Uh, I, I think it's just a 2x. Make it smaller. Make it Let's tiny. See. Let me make sure. <laughs> like, I mean, not super tiny, but like my gut tells me that um, if if the if we're DDoSing ourselves with these workers, we could uh, decrease the amount of workers that are available and decrease the amount the number of workers that are running, and theoretically that should smooth out our 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 stream. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a it's a one x dyno, and we have one of them. Uh, so I think we're as low as we can go. Uh, how many? Um, so let's let's commit this, and then I want to chase that thread yeah. for a second. Uh, get. Does this look like it is accurate code? Like I that looks like it's accurate those. code to me, and it looks like it is the only thing we want to add. C plus Betsy plus Jackson. Yay! Git config global user.name. Z, Betsy, Jackson. Uh, git checkout dash B. I don't think we're on a branch. Uh, uh, what do we want to call this branch and the commit? Errors. Yeah. From forcing retries? Sure. Let's git commit. And I don't know what my editor is. Oh, it's nano. All right, so let's. what's a good commit message for this, Betsy? You're better at this than I am. Um, you can also just tell me, and I'll type. Um, it'll be easier if I type, because I need to think through it a bit. Thank you, okay. though. <laughs> um, so what are the things you're thinking about impacting this decision? So one of the things I like to do with commit messages is have a short summary and then a, of what is of um, the actual feature um, or business facing reason this is happening and then the technical details underneath. Um, 
Okay. Because so that helps. what would you call, what is the actual future of business facing reason from your perspective for, for this commit? What I would Jackson say is hopefully um, reduce downtime from activity notification spikes. All right. And then I'm going to take a gander at these technical details. Uh, activity notifier, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Activity notifier appears to fail for Android users and then retry itself over and over. Uh, I don't know what just happened. Try yeah. to restrict um, number of characters per line. Yeah, I'm trying to... <sighs> so... And maybe Android, maybe not. Oh, it's not uh, It's not Android necessarily? Not necessarily. So for some for users. certain users. By gracefully handling the SNS error, we hope that the uh, uh, job I'm going to call this job here, uh, will not reinsert itself into the queue and will allow the, and will therefore not overload the RDS write IOPS. Yep. Uh, well, the job um, will not reinsert into itself into the queue. Cool. Is there any? Is this the place that you would note that we didn't actually look at or fix the SNS error? That that's like a future thing. Yes. 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 That's a great uh, place to do this. Not fixed the SNS error. We are merely logging. Enter. Logging it until uh, in and may or may not fix it later or or somehow inform customer support or something that there is a person who can't get notifications. Does that sound right? Yep. All right, I'm going to exit. I really don't know how to use Nano very well. Yay! And I'm going to push. Bon Yay! Oh, wait, did I do a branch? I did a branch. Uh, get push set upstream origin prevent SNS from forcing retries. And my permissions are not. Oh, that's because I'm not doing it inside of Tmux. So I'm using SSH agent forwarding because I think that's super cool. But it's also. Um, oh wait, I think I need to control shift C. Yay. All right. So thank you, Jackson. Uh, we were going thank to you. submit this as a patch to notably core. We were going to rely on you and your team to figure out how and when to deploy this and that kind of thing. Uh, in the meantime, the other thing I would recommend we take a real quick look at in Heroku Landia. Uh, is I'm willing to bet if we look at, so we got this one worker, it's super tiny. But I'm willing to bet our sidekick concurrency is relatively high. And nope, that is a bad idea. Hide config variables. Uh, thankfully, nothing on that was useful or interesting. It was just the air break notifier key. Uh, so we don't have to worry about rotating anything. Uh, but the inside of there, the sidekick concurrency variable is probably something like 30 or something. If you could look at that and just tell me what it is, that's the other thing that I think we might want to evaluate. All right, what am I looking for? The con look, yeah, look for the config variables for a sidekick concurrency. Ooh, look at all this memory usage. Look at that. Side, sidekick concurrency is one. Okay, so that means one huh. process. 
That's Look at that memory usage. not what I would have expected. Which wow. this could have been something that I know when we were looking at this with Ty Z, uh, mm -hmm. Ty was changing the Puma uh, variables in the concurrency. And that's when we jumped to six dinos, I think, from four. And we reduced workers from two to one. And there was some concurrency changed at that time. So that also could potentially be adding to the issues we're experiencing since that time. OK. Um, my guess is you probably don't need as many dinos as you have on the website. OK. Because uh, if we look at your, your memory usage on a per dino basis, you're doing pretty good. Um, I, I'm actually, yeah, I would leave them. I would leave them at this. Well, I don't know, Betsy. What when you're looking at this, does it tell you anything about like, oh, we have too many workers or too few workers or something? From a dino not immediately off the top of my head. I mean, it's not. It seems really steady. So, I think we capped the the memory usage. Yeah, that How makes sense. Capped? What's that? What strategy did you use for capping it? Uh, I don't know. I just recall that being a part okay. of the conversation. And one quick thing to note is that also there are some Heroku automatic dyno restarts that happen to coincide with a couple of these spikes on Heroku. So there'll be like three automatic Heroku restarts that happen, which is maybe one per every two dynos. I don't know. But there's three mm -hmm. that happen. And then we'll have the first issue. So a couple days ago on the 13th or so when we had that issue, the first one was preceded by those dyno restarts. So interesting. Could so be totally could coincidental, be... but it's happened. I've yeah. noticed this twice that they preceded an issue. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, I think that is a brand new entrance point into the problem. And I'm not, I don't think we really have the time to, to deal, to, to investigate that right now. But over the next couple of weeks, if you could monitor and see if the downtime is happening, that sounds like a really good down, uh, point to reassess. So my expectation is we're probably going to need to do at least one more, if not two more of these sessions um, to kind of really get you back into a happy place. Um, but uh, if hopefully, like, I feel like that sounds like a really good starting point for our next session. How does that sound to you, Betsy? Seems good to me. All right. Thank you both. To yeah. All of our viewers. Thank you for watching, um, two of them. That is an amazing number for us because this is our second time doing this and that is twice as many as who watched it last time. So 100% growth. We've got those unicorns woo, woo. Like, on the ropes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we will be trying to, assuming I did not screw up my recording system again, take this, cut it down, uh, put it into a smaller kind of like more digestible chunks um, and then offering that for uh, for purchase on Gumroad, and we're trying to figure out what the correct you know price point is for it, and how we do all that. Um, maybe it's free, maybe it's not. We're not sure. Um, but if you like this and you want to, you know, see more of it, uh, it would be a, a great signal would be to buy it or to have your coworkers buy it, um, because then we know that we can start doing more and more of this to shift our time and attention away from typing aggressively for cash and more towards creating real useful educational material for you and your team that is focused on actual problems for actual companies with actual customers instead of, you know, Z pulls an exercise out of his hat and tells you how important it is to do, you know, recursion understanding or whatever. Yeah. All right. I think we're good. Bye. Bye. See ya. I don't know how to stop it. How do I stop it? Is this it? There we go. And I'm ending the event. So now we're gone. Boop. Da 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 da.